Well, I don't go look for shit. He does have a capacity to shift. And I think that's also some also some kind of psychological things that uh, also a, a, a part of her. Uh, because she is a kind of a radical inside this kind of these maturity courses. So dying to get out. Uh, and, and she is, she has all the characteristics of an orphan who is abandoned. Uh, and she's abandoned actually twice in some ways. She's abandoned the first time she's abandoned. And Holly Springs out her parents died. Uh, and she's seen taking money from a white man who's actually a doctor uh, who has uh, gotten uh, her father's savings to give to the family when the father was on his deathbed. Uh, and but she's seen from this white man, and she's accused of his betrayal. Uh, because she had decided to uh, take care of the children left herself, or often the brothers and sisters herself, instead of farming uh, them out to others. And people thought that her real motive was uh, that she wanted to uh, really partake in prostitution. And this really, this really was a dagger. In, in her heart. Uh, so, uh, so, she, so, she, so, so she has all these sort of um, uh, 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 characteristics, uh, uh, capacity to endure a regimen, and that she goes, she's just relentless. Uh, she also uh, has this, uh, which most psychologists talk about, which also, with this anger, she also is so determined to transform it into something positive. Uh, which she which ends up being able to do, she transforms it into the uh, activism and into this anti uh, uh, Um The catalyst for the real turn, there are lots of other things that begin going on, but this is how, how she begins to climb, really climbs that hill uh, from the Victorian tradition to this modern activist uh, tradition with the mentioning of uh, the good friend of Thomas Moss uh, in March of 1882. Moss is the owner of a uh, grocery store uh, and the co-op store. In fact, there are about uh, uh, 10 uh, citizens, black citizens of Memphis own the store together. I think they're very proud of it. Uh, uh, Moss is also kind of a symbol uh, of the New South and the Last time's progress that I was uh, telling you about. He was a mail carrier. You know, even then you had to pass a civil service exam to be a mail carrier. He had been, I looked to, uh, into his history, he'd been saving money at the Freeman's Bank since the age of 13. He'd been barber. He wasn't one of the, you know, he was one of the strivers, which is, which is really Elsa Wells' social group. These strivers, not the, uh, not liberal arts educated, not a professional in that sense. Uh, but uh, a man who just represented taking every advantage he could and working hard. So he was a mail carrier as well as the president of this grocery. For the other. A number of incidents uh, take place. The, the grocery is a competitor to a white owned grocery in the same area. And the owner of that white owned grocery participates in a number of uh, incidents that ends up in a riot and that ends up getting the three men. Uh, who are part of the, uh, the uh, people's grocery, including Moss, uh, put in jail. And uh, uh, three o'clock in the morning, on March 9th, uh, a mob uh, comes outside of the prison and takes the three men out of the prison and tortures them uh, and kills them and lynches them. And so, uh, Wells, who never had many friends, Moss was one of the closest. He was driving the people in the world. And um, uh, this lynching really begins to begin to really open your eyes to what lynching really is in the late 19th and 20th century. Of course, it has nothing to do with race. It has all to do with economic competition and what to do with free black bodies who are competing now economically. Uh, in this uh, period of time. Uh, uh, also, Thomas Moss in the newspapers is criminalized 
and I'm not an upstanding citizen. He's called the scoundrel. He's called the prison prison of death. He didn't realize an understanding about, another understanding beginning of another understanding about class and what's really going on. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the idea that now people are spinning things about uh, African Americans, about the African uh, American uh, character. Um, uh, she begins to see the economic motives behind uh, all of this. Uh, uh, and uh, she begins to understand that the, this cavalier culture, um, because what Wells understands uh, in uh, about this lynching, that the people who lynched, the, lynched Thomas Moss, they were not the scum. These were the leading citizens, white citizens. Uh, uh, and so she begins to have another sense of what that idea is about. You know, turning, beginning to turn things upside down, beginning to think, look at the uh, culture of the South. Uh, uh, this guy had, was doing everything he was supposed to do, everything he was asked to do. And still uh, was killed. So she has another idea about this sense of achievement and the inevitability of progress with this kind of achievement, and that achievement in and of itself uh, was um, uh, uh, useful for political change in this lynching. And she takes the, uh, I think, tremendously courageous step of moving beyond this kind of Victorian ideas to follow this logic of the lynching, as I mentioned. I'm going to end with just reading uh, just a few pages uh, of a chapter uh, uh, called The Truth About Lynching, which is the name again of this article. And this is what she's writing about in 1892 and what she begins to understand and how things begin to, begin to turn around for her. Uh, Let me just say this for After the uh, Moss lynching, Wells begins to investigate lynchings herself. Uh, she's an early investigator reporter. She certainly is before many of the muckrakers of the progressive era in the 20th century. Uh, and she goes to the site of lynchings. I mean, she just does the lynchings. She reads the council all She has to go and she interviews people. She understands the scientific methods of the uh, emerging uh, social sciences using uh, 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 statistics, using on-site uh, interviews, um, uh, and, uh, and of course, now uh, looking at the, uh, and that's a whole another, uh, as many of you might know, uh, the scientific racism of that period really looks at, says that blacks are, are regressing uh, on this evolutionary, Darwinistic evolutionary scale of progress. Everybody else is going in one direction, blacks are going the other. And this is the reason for their creativity, this is the reason for the lasciviousness and the proclivity to rape. And, uh, and, and men have proclivity to rape because women are so, they're women are so lascivious. Uh, so she has to then begin to sort of unravel all of this uh, in uh, what she is uh, uh, writing about. Let me just uh, right, just one aspect of uh, some of her most compelling words were directed to the black community. In the final section of her editorial, Self Help, she added new meaning to the idea that the Afro American can only do for himself what no one else can do for him. And so, Ida's purpose here was to challenge the traditional attitudes of blacks, who, now unlike her, still believed in the old formula that racial uplift, social harmony, and individual achievement alone could inexorably lead to the restoration of their rights. Their single-minded devotion to general education and financial strength were worthy goals, but they were not agents, agents of change. For the white supremacist words she had described, no good deed was punished. Indeed, the old social contract reached with progressive paternalists and this idea of mutual obligations with dead sheets system for the present Jim Crow laws and violence. And despite all that had been achieved, no other news goes out to the world saying that it stamps us as a race of cutthroats, robbers, and lustful wild beasts. Blacks had to work proactively to engender a healthier public sentiment, she wrote, and, a, and supported um, the independent black press, uh, which was the best instrument of truth. The people must know before they can act, I believe. 
and citing the number of instances in which blacks met their deaths because, deaths because of flimsy evidence, she called uh, for the race to provide resources for the investigative and fact-finding missions. In other words, what had to be won in the late, late 19th century was a modern era public relations war, not just a moral one. Self-help also meant an activist strategy that no longer depended solely on elites, but looked toward an interclass insurgency in which the laboring class of blacks was central. To northern capital and Afro-American labor, the South owes its rehabilitation, she continued. Uh, so she's talking about civil disobedience. If labor is withdrawn, capital will not remain. The Afro-American is thus the backbone of the South. So she's really the first beginning as a civil rights measure not just as an economic measure of advocating uh, civil disobedience. Uh, by the way, in Memphis, after the Moss murder, she tells blacks uh, to leave Memphis because the city will no longer protect them. 20% of the black population leaves, uh, uh, creating an economic uh, panic uh, in the city. So she really begins a very sophisticated understanding the economic aspect of civil rights. Uh, uh, but if civil disobedience was not enough, Wells made no hesitation to call for armed defense, for nothing was to be further gained by a sacrifice of manhood and self-respection. So she's coming a long way from this idea of no protest and thus not bring the worst out of people. Citing examples from Oklahoma, she knew that the only times blacks avoided scheduled lynchings was when they were armed and prepared to protect themselves. Quote, the lesson this teaches us in which every Afro-American should ponder is that a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home. And it should be used for that protection that, which the law refuses to give. So, the truth about lynching and its role is sought to leave the old Victorian beliefs behind in which the characteristics of race, class, and gender were fixed by the new laws. In her universe, it was white women who were sexualized, black women victimized. It was white men who were feral and barbaric, black men successful and sentimental. But her juxtaposition added up to more than a petulant inversion of racial roles and characteristics. When Wells counseled blacks that wealth and social advancement were not agents of change in themselves, she was laying the groundwork for protest movements in that post-Victorian world where conflict had its place where progress was not inevitable without political protest and action, and where language, not natural law, defined the meaning of race. In order for Wells to follow the logic it's, it, of lynching its ultimate, to its ultimate conclusion, she herself had to, to take a deliberate flight from the radical innocence that was at the heart of Victorian culture. Quote, it is with no pleasure I dip my hands in the corruption you exposed, she told the readers. I then place the language of gentility with reality and dispense with the false delicacy of the unspeakable crime. Right? She was one of the few women reformers who actually used the word rape and had learned to do so without apology. Wells understood the radical implications of her message and was prepared to endure the consequences, even as she said, uh, the heavens might fall. We might ask you about some of those consequences. She was faulted the worst names that you can imagine and particularly in a period like this. Um, uh, but she had made up her mind that her campaign, wherever it took her, was calling her, and that she would see it through. It was the determination of a woman who was indeed dauntless as a black press characterized her. It was also the determination of a woman whose campaign against Lynchon fit perfectly with her own leadership aspirations and emotional, emotional makeup. As a southern exile, she possessed an authority that gave her words more weight than those of northern leaders. The outrage of lynching matched her in a storm, and the blood libel horror of the crime gave Wells a wide berth of expression for the moral indignation and for her moral indignation and anger. Wells' crusade to tell the truth about lynching gave her the means to reorder the world and her and the racist place within it. Once defamed herself, now she could expose the lies that sullied the racist name and restore it. Quote, somebody must show that the Afro-American race is more sinned against the city of Wells, who had found the vehicle of her destiny 